Hi, my name is Kanal, and welcome to the Geeks of the Valley podcast, which connects with some of the brightest minds globally who are leading their respective industries today to discuss the hottest upcoming industry trends and how their work is affecting the global economy. What started off as a coffee chat has now grown into a global platform for visionaries. This morning from New York, we have the ex-CEO of Investopedia, who is now the CEO of Meetup, and has recently authored a book called Decide and Conquer, 44 Decisions That Will Make or Break All Leaders. Please welcome David Siegel. David, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm so glad to be here. As a former geek and appreciator of all things geek, I'm, uh, this is the podcast for me. And how are things with you in light of the COVID situation? Is everyone working uh, decentralized? Yeah, so right now in uh, at Meetup, we have been out of the office for a couple of years. We were on a month-to-month office lease, so we took money that we were spending on office space, and we've actually had given a lot of it to employees and wellness perks and other perks just to help people that are burnt out during this time. And next month, we are finally going back to an office in Midtown Manhattan, and we can't wait. But one of the things we've done is every single month during the pandemic, except for when it was particularly bad, we always got together as a company, anyone who's in the New York metro area, once a month for us to just bond and spend time together and keep our community going. Because Meetup is a lot about IRL in real life, in person. So we got to keep that community going for our employees as well. Well, what an exciting corporate culture to have. Uh, Let's jump into the first question here, shall we? Sounds great. Tell us about your path to becoming a tech CEO. Okay. The path was windy, filled with ups and downs and high points and low points. You know, a lot of times people hear about a CEO and they're like, oh, you know, went to a consulting top business school, got promoted. It is not a straight and narrow path. It's always curvy with lots of challenges. I've been fired from jobs twice, in fact, on that path. I um, one time in my career worked in human resources early in my career. That's not a typical path for a CEO. I've worked in retail, actually in a pharmacy chain. I've worked in digital media, worked in um, e-commerce, and now ultimately in a subscription business at Meetup. So I think the one thing that's that's been consistent through the path, however, is mentors. Um, I actually just got, came back this past weekend from a reunion of a consulting firm that I worked in. That was my first job out of college. I was 22 to 24. And it reminded me of all the mentors that I've had through that job and throughout my career. And I would say probably one of the greatest impacts that I've ever had in life in the path to becoming a CEO was uh, the mentors and the learning that I've had. So ultimately, um, you know, I worked, I was an early employee at DoubleClick, which at the time was one of the largest internet advertising companies ultimately acquired by Google for a few billion dollars. And then I worked at a number of different digital companies from Seeking Alpha to Everyday Health to 1-800-Flowers, then became president of Seeking Alpha, CEO of Investopedia. And for the last uh, close to four years, been the CEO of Meetup. Speaking of Meetup, what is your general approach to leadership, radical transparency? Yeah, I mean, very much that's it. I would say when I first came to Meetup, there were, it was a real lack of transparency, particularly around financials. The company was owned by WeWork, which in itself was a interesting saga. And and the company was losing close to $20 million. They lost close 20, about $20 million in 2018. And again, in 2019, employees had no idea how much money the company was losing. The company had ballooned and in, in, over doubled in size in less than a year after WeWork acquired the company because of kind of WeWork's approach to growing at all costs, including any profit. And people were unaware. And we actually, when I joined, we had to do layoffs pretty quickly because I don't believe in running companies with massive losses unless there's massive growth that's happening. And we weren't having massive growth. The only growth that was happening was growth and losses. Um, and then we finally started sharing financials. People just didn't realize we were spending over $100,000 on a 
you know, on a holiday party and, and tens of thousands of dollars on barbecues and other types of employee events. It didn't necessarily make me the most popular person, but my goal is to create, make sure the meetup exists and sustains forever because our mission is so incredibly important. So I would say sharing everything from our, the good, the bad, and the ugly. If we're not doing a good job in something, we share it and we tell the company about it. If we are, have challenged financials, we share it. If we do great financially, we share it. Um, what, if, whatever is happening in, in, in my mind or what's ever happening in reality, if we have to shut an area down. If we have to reinvest dollars in something else, we share it with all employees. And that means having employee listening. We, we have an all hands meeting every other week. We have employee listening sessions, sometimes weekly, sometimes monthly. We have manager listening sessions. We just do a lot. We have employee engagement surveys to listen to feedback from employees and, and all that's helped. And, and in the times of the great resignation, uh, relative to most tech companies, we're actually doing quite well. Speaking of WeWork, what did the whole WeWork saga leave you with at the end of the day? What was <laughs> your key takeaway? Key takeaway for me is that when you're running a company, fundamental business rules never cease to be important. You can't just assume that you could build a company and the profit will ultimately come if the you know, marginal value of what you're doing is a loss every single time. If you're losing you know, a dime every time you do something, it doesn't suddenly just start making significant amounts of money. Um, that's number one. Number two is just the importance of culture. I think in many ways, if people watch We Crashed, you know, what I typically respond to them or, or other WeWork documentaries, they say, We Crashed was an exaggeration, right? And like, mm, the only thing about We Crashed was that they didn't go far enough and how crazy the environment actually was. There were things that were even, even more upsetting and frustrating that the movie didn't even kind of hit on. And ultimately, ultimately, company culture matters a lot. It drives success. And I think we work at a toxic culture in many ways. And I've always just deeply believed in building a culture where you're, you're valuing employees and, and you're taking care of employees. And, uh, and if you do that, then they take care of customers um, and clients as well. That was my number one takeaway. So speaking of a toxic culture, can you share your thoughts about the power and impact of community on business and life in general? Oh my gosh, sure. So let's talk about first business, then we'll talk about life in terms of community. The great resignation is something that's happening in the United States, I believe it's happening in Europe and it's happening across the world. That millions more people are resigning than had in the past. And the number one reason why people are resigning is because the culture of community at work is in many ways gone, why? Because when people are only have Zoom-based relationships, they're not meeting IRL. They're not coming to the office every day. They're not you know, seeing each other and going for the coffees and lunches and building those tight relationships that people did pre-pandemic. Then there's not a sense of community at work. And when there's not a sense of community at work, people don't necessarily wanna stay at the company. They're looking for something more because we're inherently in our DNA, community people. In fact, like the way we survived for tens of thousands of years as hunter-gatherer societies was in a community of people. If you tried to be your lone person, you would die in the wilderness. It you would not be able to survive. We need a community to survive and, and it's inherent in, in who we are and what we need. So it absolutely is leading to uh, many people leaving companies because they don't feel as connected to the larger mission, larger company. That's kind of why community is so important for employees. And then for life in general, my goodness, everything is better in life with community. You learn better when you're taking a class with others in a community. You um, can meet your significant other. Uh, I know so many people that have, you know, because of community, whether it's synagogues or churches or mosques, or frankly, sports and playing kickball together, they meet their significant other uh, through community. Um, community is responsible for you know, the, the joys of life. And you know, as someone who um, grew up and is still um, in, 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 has an Orthodox Jewish home, I grew up in an area where when, if God forbid someone passed away, our community would support um, families 
for weeks, sometimes a month plus, and bringing food to them and helping out in times of sorrow. And then times of joy, if children are born, again, community would bring food to them and help them. I guess there's a lot of food related stuff in my community, but community is, is there for you to support you in times of sorrow and is there for you in times of joy. And ultimately community is the antidote to the most important thing, which is also meetup serves, which is the loneliness epidemic. The 46% the of people regularly, not sometimes, not occasionally, but regularly feel lonely. And among people who are in their early 20s, late teens, referred to as Gen Zers in the United States, among that group, it's 62% of people are regularly feeling lonely. Community is the antidote for that. And when you have loneliness, you have depression, anxiety, other types of uh, challenges in life. So if you can't tell, I'm a big pro on community. <laughs> so David, you wrote this amazing book called Decide and Conquer. What are some of the decision-making best practices you discuss in your book? Sure. So I'll head on top two or three and you know go from there. Number one, if you want to make a smart decision, surround yourself by people who disagree with you. It is so important to not surround yourself if you're a leader or if you're an individual contributor or just in life in general with just quote unquote, yes, people. When you have disagreement, then you have alternative thinking and maybe that leads to tension at times, but it'll also lead to a smarter decision, frankly, because there's just more back and forth. Sometimes in a room, if there's no one disagreeing, I'll just say, I don't know if I disagree, but I'm gonna disagree just because it's important for us to see both perspectives on what decision we're gonna make. So disagreement is the key to decision-making. The second is to understand what your decision biases are. Everyone has numerous biases and I'm sure the four most common decision biases that people have and uh, people should just recognize what those are and fig figure out what they might need to do to offset them. So recency bias, which is the concept that you're gonna prioritize and overweight what just happened than something that is an equally important data point but may have happened a year, two or three ago. So if you're going out with someone and you break up, the next person you're looking for, you're looking for the opposite in certain respects of the person you just broke up with and not taking into account the full gamut of people that you may have thought about you know, necessarily in the past. Confirmation bias, which is just looking to confirm, not having disagreement, but looking to confirm your opinions about whatever it may be. Status quo bias, which is the concept that you're, there's a fear of change and you'd rather be in a bad situation and just stick with it than the fear of the unknown and what could happen. And the last one is called sunk cost fallacy, which is just the concept that people don't appreciate that if they invested a lot of time and energy into building a company or any specific activity, then that's gone. It's a sunk cost, move on. Just because I spent three years in a job, I'm not happy, move on next one. Just got three years in a relationship, move on. It's a sunk cost. Just because I spent $200 for this food in a restaurant, doesn't mean I have to eat all the food if it's not gonna make me happy. Sunk cost fallacy. And I could go on to, you know, and share other decision-making practices and that I've learned throughout my life. Uh, but, you know, that's a start. <laughs> And in your book, you speak about the law of large numbers and mm. how it can play to a person's benefit. Uh, it is very similar to, as one would say, every no is one step closer to a yes. W what are your thoughts on this? Oh my gosh. So <clears throat> what I say to our sales teams um, at times is don't get to guess, get to resolution. Meaning getting a bunch of no's will help to save you time because you don't need to spend lots of time on the, on the maybes. And the worst is when you have you know, 10, 20, 100 different options that you're all still talking to, and now you're wasting your time on the, on the no's. So get to resolution, or every no could turn, turn into a yes. Agree completely. The second point that you made, which is a law of large numbers, is really important. So I'll tell you a story, because who doesn't like stories? So when I was in uh, business school, I was in Warden Business School and looking to graduate, and everyone else kind of you know, not everyone, most other people went through the warden um, career offices and finding a job because we had the top best investment banks and consulting firms, you know, all, all come to warden. And I, I did a couple of there and I ended up even with an offer for BCG, Boston Consulting Group. 
uh, to, to work for them, but I really didn't want to go through the standard recruiting process. So I decided one day <laughs> that I would send a thousand emails out in a 24 hour period, just to like rip the bandit off, get it done. And send a thousand emails out to every single C-level executive that I could find their email addresses for of companies I'd be interested in. And I sent a thousand emails out. I stayed up all night, just got it done. I didn't want to have to think about it for too long. That's a law of large numbers. And then what ended up happening is I ended up talking to dozens of like CEOs and C-level executives at companies, which is pretty extraordinary because they didn't have that great experience necessarily before business school. And it ended up that I got my first job out of business school because of it. And I ended up also getting a second job out of business school because of the original reach out that I had done three years prior. Um, the, the quick story on that is I was reaching out to people to, um, I wanted to be an assistant to the CEO or assistant to the chairman and work with a chairman on their board decks and board meetings um, and strategic plans and things like that. And I reached out to the founder and CEO of 100 Flowers, an incredible person named Jim McCann. And I talked to him when I was in school and tried to convince him that I wanted to uh, work for him. And he said, yeah, we don't have a real role like that. Okay, come three years later, a friend of mine says, David, you gotta look at this. And I said, what? He said, an, a, a, a job posting just got listed on the Warden Alumni Database. And the job boasting says, 1-800-Flowers looking for an assistant to the CEO. Now I talked to him three years prior. So I sent him an email to Jim McCann saying, I don't know if you remember this, but you know, part of my reaching out to, to thousands of people, we reached out to you, I spoke to you. We had a wonderful conversation. You said it wouldn't work out. If that impacted your decision to find an assistant to the CEO, that's so amazing. That's so great. And he, sent me a note back with five words because he didn't remember my name. He just remembered I went to Warden. And it said, I was looking for you. I was looking for someone for back to the time that I had sent out that large volume of, of email. So you never know what's going to happen. And by sending a large volume out, it creates options for yourself. The more options that you create for yourself in, in making a decision, the luckier you can end up being. And lucky things happen, let's say one in a hundred times, making up that number, of course. But if you have a thousand options out there, then you'll get lucky 10 times. If you have a hundred options out there, you'll get lucky once. If you have 10 options out there, in terms of law of large numbers, then you may not get lucky at all. Going off this point, some part of self-confidence must have played a role in this. And within your book, you talk about the importance of self-confidence and being bold in life and how it played a role in the way you approached the jobs you did. In a sense, it is about having the go big or go home and fail head first mentality. Why is it that people always seem to underestimate their abilities? Are there societal norms which we have adopted that have pigeonholed us into thinking in a certain way? I mean, absolutely. First of all, the, the imposter syndrome is real. So the number of people whom I know that are outrageously intelligent and have been incredibly successful and have imposter syndrome, meaning that they don't think that they're that capable. I don't, I'm sure there's many better definitions of it, but that they think that they're an imposter essentially and that they're not as good as people give them credit for. That's what imposter syndrome is, is, is tre tremendous. I just recently met with someone who's written 20 books, 20 books, number one best-selling author. And that person has said to me, yeah, I don't know if I'm really a writer. I'm like, are you kidding me? Um, so, you know, it's, it's incredible because sometimes people can be enormously successful in business and life and their endeavors and their families and still lack confidence. And it's deep seated is the reality. Um, for someone, I spoke to someone recently who, again, incredibly successful C-level executive. And what he said to me is he said, you know, it has to do a lot with the way that he was parented. And if your parents are, you know, sometimes constantly pointing out your flaws, constantly pointing out your mistakes, um, overly critical about, about things, 
you know, it has a, it has an impact. And I'm certainly not saying that everyone that has imposter syndrome is solely because of the way that they're parented, but that contributes towards why some people do lack confidence and have that. The other thing that contributes towards it is the reality is we do live in an unfair world. And uh, I do have tremendous privilege as a, as a white male kind of in this world. And I think whether it's people of color or, or different gender, um, it's, it's harder. It's harder. It has, it used to be much, much harder. It's still incredibly hard. And, and I think that has an impact and it should have, and it has an impact on imposter syndrome as well. And people's, um, challenges in their self-esteem and their confidence. Um, fortunately I grew up in a very strong family. Um, and, and I have, and I have, a, and I have a lot of privilege you know, in life that I have a tremendous gratitude for, but not everyone is so lucky. And, and I think it's, it's, it's painful to me at times to see people who are just absolutely extraordinary, but, but um, struggle, struggle with their confidence. And, and it is true that um, I think the more confidence you have, it does help you with success. And, um, and uh, it's, it's something that I'm, I'm acutely aware of. The other important thing is not to be overly confident, not to be haughty, not to be arrogant. And you know, one of the learnings from WeWork is, is, is that also could come crashing down just as much, if not more, if there's a, if there's a real arrogance to, to it. And overconfidence is uh, differently dangerous than underconfidence as well. And speaking of employees, Within your book, you outline work for them and they will work for you. I think it was one of the deepest lessons by far. Give us some insight as to how you formulated this thought process and what caused it to finally click in your eyes. Yeah, sure. I mean, the goal of a CEO is to enable the success of everyone that works for them. I like to think of what's called the upside down organizational chart. I'm on the bottom of the organizational chart. My job is to support everyone else, not on the top and the bottom, and to enable our chief head of marketing to be successful, enable our head of technology to be successful, to enable our head of sales to be successful, enable our head of product to be successful. That's my entire job. And if each of those people I support and each of those people are successful, well, guess what? The company is going to be successful. I'm going to be successful. It's not about me as CEO being successful. It's about everyone and what they do, our leaders, their job is to enable the success of the people who work for them. And the people who work for their, them's job is to enable the success of the individual contributors who work for them. If everyone is thinking along that way, then the result of that is success. Sometimes support is not saying, I support you. How could I help you? Sometimes the best support is to say, this is what you're not doing right. And that's a lot of support too or this is what I'd like to address, or um, I think we need to stop doing X and start doing Y. That's also supportive and that's also very helpful. Support isn't just you know, um, saying to someone, what do you need from me? Sometimes it's also giving more direction and better direction that provides a lot of support too. So it's understanding the broad definition of support and understanding that that's the number one job kind of of all leaders. And in your opinion, how do you ensure a clear transfer of leadership? not just with leaders themselves, but with the idea of the leader, the legacy they baked into the company. Yeah, I mean, so Scott Heiferman founded Meetup with a couple of other individuals back in right after 9-11. To tell you the brief story, he saw the terrible tragedies that were happening around 9-11, and he saw that that was bonding people together And then he said to himself and others, it shouldn't take a tragedy to build community. How could I build community outside of tragedy? Scott ran this company for 16 years before I took over as the first outside CEO of Meetup. And it was really important to me, especially in the beginning, to make sure that people understood that Scott is the DNA. He's the heart and soul of the company and the company always has the DNA of the founder in them. And it's important not to just completely discount that, but to find ways of embracing the founder, find ways of the founder still continuing to help the company, even if in a non-operational role, even in a more quote unquote spiritual role, it's still incredibly valuable. So there were different things that Scott did, whether it was making introductions, meeting with executives, he would take 
numerous new hires on something called the meetup crawl and going from meetup event to a meetup event so they could feel really connected and see hands-on kind of the amazing work that we do at meetup and in helping with the loneliness epidemic and helping people you know, to be successful. I think it's incumbent upon leaders who take over for a founder to find ways in which the original, original founder can still add value. It doesn't always work and it may not happen, but it's always worth and important to try to explore. And a lot of the book you know, dealt with that kind of transition like you referenced, for sure. So David, going back to the point on self-confidence, in your book, you talk about self-confidence in relation to salary negotiation. In your opinion, how do you determine the fine line between negotiating way too much versus negotiating the right amount? How does one even define uh, the right amount? Well, I guess I would define the right amount as if you walk away after the negotiation and you feel like, and you have regret that you didn't ask for something that was important to you. And it, oftentimes it's a non-monetary opportunity rather than just a financial opportunity to get more salary. Like I'll talk about that shortly. Then you didn't negotiate enough. And I would say you tip the balance if in some way there was antagonism, um, stress, anger potential by the other party in how aggressive you were negotiating. But generally I would say due to imposter syndrome and other reasons we've talked about already here, people are not aggressive enough in asking for what they need. And I would say people should feel more comfortable pushing the envelope and asking for more than they may have felt comfortable. And last thing I would say around negotiations is that it's not all about just the compensation. So yes, of course, ask for more money. Of course you should. No one shouldn't do that. Ask for more money, it never hurts to ask. But there's a lot of other things that you can negotiate outside of just purely higher salary. You can negotiate and ask for a review in six months. You could ask for what the career path is in terms of when your next promotion is at, at a particular time. You negotiate and ask for um, different uh, allowances for expense reimbursement and get clarification around how that works. There's a whole host of things. You can negotiate and ask for an office if that's something that's important to you or a certain piece of equipment that is important to you if you're, if you're an engineer or a designer and you want a higher end kind of machine. So think about those things prior to starting and think about what will enable you to succeed like we talked about earlier. A company's job is to enable their people to succeed. So if you speak up and you tell people what's important to you to be able to feel good and succeed, then you'll be in great shape. And before I started Meetup, there were a number of non-financial components to things that I asked for. For example, I didn't want to report to Adam Newman. Um, I wanted to report to the president of the company, not the CEO, and I asked for that. Um, I actually asked for kind of a three month break to figure out what the company's strategy was before I would have to uh, share with everyone what the company's strategy is. I said, I need three months to figure this out. Don't go back to me in a week or two and say, what are you gonna do with Meetup? I, give me a three month time period. So I quote unquote negotiated that. So think about which things are important. I negotiate what the roles would be of different executives and the founder you know, prior to starting as well. Set yourself up for success before you start, and it doesn't just have to do with dollars and cents. So switching the topic to the more personal side of things, there were probably moments in your life where your neck was up against the fence, and you had to engineer the acquisition of Meetup out of WeWork, no matter the odds. What was going through your mind during this time and how did you get yourself to come through and execute during such high pressure to do what so many would say the impossible? <laughs> okay, glad you read the book on this one. Um, so when WeWork was imploding and the company's valuation was $47 billion and then a big article in the Wall Street Journal came out talking about a lot of improprieties and it went down to $40 billion, then $30 billion, then $20 billion, then $10 billion, then a canceled IPO. I got a call from the president of 
of uh, WeWork, Artie Minson. And he said, David, we are selling Meetup and I need you to try to find the buyer. And we have to find the buyer of Meetup. We're divesting it. We're investing lots of other businesses in the next month. Like find one as quickly as possible. So I said, what do I know? I'm, I'm not like, I'm not an M&A person, mergers and acquisition person. I don't know uh, potential buyers of companies. Like I'm an operator. I run companies. I'm a CEO. He said, still try. And then WeWork started introducing me to potential buyers. And one after another, they were just terrible. There are people who didn't care about employees. They didn't care about our, our, our mission. They didn't care about our, our focus on curing the loneliness epidemic. They were in for a quick buck. They were look, looking to, to fire tons and tons of people and then just resell the company immediately or quickly. And um, it really was a problem for me. So I decided I needed to myself find the buyer that could potentially save the company. So again, law of large numbers, I reached out to like a hundred potential people who would know buyers. And then they introduced me to what, close to a hundred uh, potential buyers at the company. And I was working 24 seven to try to find the right future owner of, of Meetup because what we do as a company at Meetup is so powerful and so helpful to tens of millions of people and helping to build community for people that I really wanted to make sure that we were going to be have, have an amazing parent company and in great hands. So I just like to win. I guess you could say I'm a pretty competitive person, whether it's in playing sports or board games or really lots of things, hopefully in a good way, but sometimes in a less good way. And I put it upon myself to say, I will find someone who is going to be an incredible uh, owner for this company so we could continue to realize our mission and uh, of building connections for people. And I just was, I never gave up, no matter what the odds were, no matter how many different companies, no matter how many rejections we got. And then finally, when Meetup was potentially going to be shut down by WeWork when the pandemic hit in March of 2020, because we were losing a lot of money and we were facing our back against the wall, like you described in the question. Finally, out of my relationship with someone named Kevin Ryan, who was the CEO of DoubleClick back, I worked there over 20 years ago, 20 years ago. And he was my mentor for these last 20 years. And I talked about mentorship as well earlier. He and I stayed in touch and he was advising me on the side about different people and different companies. And um, I went to him and I said, it's time, let's do it. And we were able to align on a price. He acquired the company in March of 2020, right when the pandemic was hitting him and another investor. And um, it's been an incredibly positive ride going on close to two and a half years now. Uh, and um, I'm very fortunate for having the owner. And I would say that never give up, never give up until it's too late and never assume that something's foregone. And even when you think that there's no chance that you can make something happen, uh, give yourself credit. And, and if you have that kind of an attitude, then oftentimes you do end up finding a way to make something a success. And to wrap up the call with our last and final question for the day, what piece of advice would you give to people out there from the journey you have had so far in life? I would say that number one, I think back to my high school quote, that when I was 17 years old and I graduated high school and my quote was, in our pursuit of happiness, sometimes it's important to pause and just be happy. Too often, people who are ambitious, like myself, and many of our listen your listeners, are looking to get ahead and move on and move on. They're, they're sacrificing their short-term happiness. And they're saying, it's okay. I'm building myself for the future. It's okay to be miserable. It's okay to be miserable. Doesn't mean you shouldn't work hard, but it's not okay to be miserable. It's not okay because it has a permanent impact on you of being miserable for a sustained period of time. It, it changes who you are, it changes your energy, it changes your outlook in life, it changes the people that you surround yourself by, it changes your personality. So finding joy in the day-to-day -day is so important, not just personally, but professionally. Taking care of yourself, doing the things that give you joy, whether it's being, being in a meetup group, which certainly could give, gives millions of people joy, or 
just doing things, taking care of yourself, especially during the pandemic is so deeply important. It's the message I would give to everyone. Yes, don't just never see, not be a hedonist and not take into account the future, but make sure you're taking care of yourself, making sure you're doing things that give you joy, that, 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 that give you sound mind, sound body, and good things will come from focusing on happiness now and not just, you know, in five, 10, 20 years, you're gonna end up being happy. And you think back to that, you know, you know, person who always says in 10 years, they'll be happy. By the time they're 80 years old or 90 years old in 10 years, you know, it's too late potentially. So take advantage of the time now. That's what I would say. And David, for people out there who are interested in catching a cup of coffee with you, or maybe just potentially getting on a call, what would be the best point of contact? Sure. I mean, I would say LinkedIn is great. Send me a LinkedIn invite. Um, certainly, if you read the book, I love getting people's feedback on Decide and Conquer um, and, and what, what resonated for them, what doesn't resonate for them. That's one of my favorite things to learn from people because I put so much of my heart and soul into it. Uh, if people want to send me an email, they can email me at david at meetup.com. Follow me on Twitter, David, at David Mayer Siegel, M-E-I-R, um, or Instagram at David Mayer Siegel. And, uh, you know, I love hearing from people, whether it's about the book or more importantly about, you know, their experiences in Meetup and, and how it may have helped or changed them and, and impacted them in some way. So thank you for asking. And, you know, you find the book on Amazon or Book Depository outside the country or local Barnes and Noble stores or anywhere else. David, it was a pleasure having you join us. And thank you so much for making the time today. This has been really wonderful, Kanal. Good to be with the Geeks of the Valley. This podcast is brought to you by Pytone, an Asian-based open source enterprise software company. Pytone offers a suite of software applications and infrastructure services to scholars and universities.